It's good to see everybody here this morning. Some of you that might be new, the heart of the valley, you're looking at me like, who's he? (laughs) What's he doing here? Uh, If you are relatively new, I'm Pastor Ken Terry. I was the executive pastor here for about eight years, and uh, it's always great to come back and see all your smiling faces and uh, all of your smiling faces and... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you remember me, huh? Yeah. Uh, you know what? Some of you got that smile. It just it's, You're like Buddy the Elf. It's just like, smiling's my favorite. How many would agree with me that there's all kinds of smiles? And smiles have an, a language of their own. Did you know that? Uh, there's all kinds. There's the, the polite smile. There's uh, the flirtatious smile. There's the uncomfortable smile. You ever shared that one? Uh, How about the sarcastic smile? Or the embarrassed smile? How about the smile of approval? How about that smile that lights up a room? Or or that smile that just says hello. You're walking by someone, you just smile, and they smile back, you're just saying hi. A smile can say all kinds of things. Now, but then there's the smile. I mean, the smile, this particular smile has power. I mean, it, it, it can do incredible things. And matter of fact, the smile, it has the capability to cover a multitude of sins. It has the ability to cover a multitude of shame. Matter of fact, the smile has the ability to cover a multitude of pain. And what I'm talking about is the smile of denial. That smile that we've all expressed at some point in our life, maybe you're wearing that smile today. It's that one that says, you know what, everything's wonderful in my life. Everything's great, but inside there's incredible turmoil. Inside there's a lot of pain. Because of what I did, or what was done to me. Inside, there's a lot of shame because of maybe something I've done. But behind that smile of denial is a heart filled with pain and shame. And sometimes we just don't want the world to know about it. Here's the problem with the smile. See, the smile of denial keeps everything concealed. You don't know. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't see the dark spot. You don't see the pain. You don't see the the guilt. You don't see the shame. You don't see all the things I'm battling internally. Because the smile of denial pretends like there's no problem. And the problem with the smile of denial, it conceals your heart in such a way that it can never be healed. Because it conceals. And so therefore it's never exposed. It's never dealt with. It's never addressed. And you kind of just go through life. With this internal pain uh, in your heart. Because you have a wounded heart. You have a broken heart. You have a heart that uh, is consumed with guilt. Anger. Frustration. You name it. The possibility is there. And so we've learned to express this particular smile in such a way that everyone around me thinks I'm great. Everyone around me thinks I got it all together. Everybody around me thinks I'm on top of the world. And they have no idea the pain that I'm battling every single day. Let me just say this. If some deep, deep change doesn't take place at the core level of who you are, You'll carry this wounded heart forever. As a Christian, I know so often we're, we're, we're searching for a fresh start. Just, I, I, I just want to get through all this. I want to put it all behind me. But let me just say this. I don't care how long you've been carrying this wounded heart, this broken heart, this heart that's consumed with sin or frustration or guilt or shame. With God, things can change. I want to share a, a, a verse with you in Psalm 34, 18. 
I think this is an incredible promise from God. The Lord is close to what? The brokenhearted. If you're battling something internally, you're hurting inside, you're broken inside, I want you to know something. Whether you feel it, think it, it doesn't matter. God's close to you. God is with you. It goes on to say, he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Today, I'm going after your heart. Today, God wants to go after your heart. But if we're going to continue to have any kind of attitude of denial to where we conceal it, it's going to make it very difficult. God wants to challenge you today. Open your heart. Let it be receptive. Let him speak into your life. Let him change your life at a core level in order that you might go forward in victory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you that you are able to carry the burden, to heal the heart, to bring restoration, regardless of the situation. Thank you for being close and near when we need you most. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, we have learned to use the smile of denial because we just don't trust people, number one. Or we struggle with trusting God, number two. Not quite at the same level, uh, because we know God can do anything, but we just kind of think that he just doesn't do it for me. So, we take things into our own hands. Have you ever taken things into your own hands? You wanted something. You're praying, God, guide me through this. God, help me with this. God, help me make the right decision. Lord, and, and you're just like waiting and waiting for the hand of God to move and to, to, to part the waters or, or whatever the situation is. And you're just not seeing that and you're not getting the results because we're, we're visual. We're, we we, we want to sense it. We want to feel it. We want to see it because so often we walk by our senses instead of by faith and then we're just not seeing it. So we're struggling. And then what happens is we're like, okay, whatever. God I'll take care of this myself now I, you don't actually have that conversation but, but your actions say that and so what happens you're like fine you know what I, I'm just getting out of this relationship I'm going to go into a new one I just need a new boyfriend I need a new girlfriend new husband new wife I'm just going to that's the problem or like you know what I just need a new job these people here are, are, are crazy I'm going to go get this, this new job, and, and, and it's going to be a lot better there. Or you know what? Better yet, I'm just going to go to a new town. I'm going to start over. Now, here's the problem with that. We tend to look for that fresh start with this broken, wounded heart. And the problem is, it, it, it's, you're just taking that old heart into a new relationship. You're going to mess that up, too. That new job or that new town. Because here's the, here's the thing that you cannot do. You cannot try to fix an internal problem with external changes. Does that make any kind of sense at all? It's not like, hey, I'm just going to take this wounded heart, which, by the way, we call that baggage. And so I'm going to take all this old baggage into the new relationship. And it's all smiles of denial. It's like, hey, oh, I'm wonderful. Oh, you just wait. You just, oh, I'm just awesome. I'm just the best. I'm wonderful. You'd just be so lucky to have me. And then all of a sudden, the, 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 you say, I do, and the fangs come out. It's like, whoa. Where'd you come from? That, what, what happened to all this? Uh, you're so awesome. And, 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 or you go to the new job, and you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm the best. You're lucky to have me, man. I'm so good. Uh, and, and on and you get in there, and you're like, man, these people are jerks too. All these employees, man, I, don't, I just can't work with these coworkers of mine. because, and, and the whole time it's inside here. You're just taking it to a new place. You know, and, and I say, you know, it's never greener on the other side. I say, don't jump the fence because you're just going to ruin that lawn too. Okay? It, it's always greener where you cultivate it where you implement change and you try to work on some things and you try to do some things. It just takes effort. Would you agree with me on that? That it takes effort? Amen. How many, hey, I can describe marriage in one word. Work. Dude, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, and we just have to work through some things sometimes. So, Here's what I want you to know. When I speak, I just want to accomplish two things. I always tell you this. Uh, I want you to know something, and then I want you to do something. Because it's not enough to know. If you're not a doer of the word of God, then forget about it. Just, just all go home. Just go to uh, In-N-Out or something. 
But if you want to take some truth and apply it to your life, change happens. So you got to be a doer of the word, as James says. Otherwise, we're all wasting our time here. And so uh, let's be that. Let's be uh, knowers and doers of God's word. So here's what I want you to know first on your outline. A fresh start requires a fresh heart. I always tell you that. I, 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 that's, I say that all the time to people. I say, look, if you want a fresh start, you better fix the heart. Otherwise, you're going to repeat. Otherwise, you're going to fall in the same trap. You're going to do it again. You're going to, because what happens is the smile and denial is powerful. And it covers up a multitude of shame, a multitude of pain. And you just go on through life. And everybody thinks it's great. And you're just lying to yourself and to everyone around you. That makes sense? So, there needs to be an internal change, not an external change. Now, here's, here's some truth I want you to think about. The key to healing is to embrace the healer. Why? Because God's presence enables you to overcome the deepest pain and level of shame. Now think about this. I want you to know something. Maybe nobody's ever told you this. There's, there's something about walking in the presence of God. Stop thinking he's some God in heaven. And every once in a while you throw up these prayers and they, you know what, maybe he'll hear me, maybe he won't. No, you are, you're engulfed in the presence of God as a believer. Know that. Yeah, but I don't really feel it. Get rid of the feelings. Okay? Feelings lie. So, uh, you mean I'm not in love? No, I'm not saying that. Feelings, though, we have to be careful that in walking with Christ. He is with us. Now, do you know all the prayers of your heart? They're all written on your heart. Now, I want you to think about this. It it is crucial that that you embrace God's presence in your life. Because that's what you need. Instead of thinking of God as some far distant land and that you just throw these prayer requests in and hopefully he hears them and, and you get some kind of response and something happens. No, the God that, that knows everything about you walks with you because he's near the broken heart and the struggling. He knows every heart or every prayer that's written on your heart before you even ask it. So he's already working before you even ask. And here's what I think is something that's crucial we have to understand when we think about God is that if I walk in his presence, I embrace his presence, I want to, to, to literally uh, walk and breathe in the presence of God because then I'm in the presence of what? The healer, uh, the prince of peace. Whatever it is you need, that's who he is. So walk in that. So now I'm walking in the answer of the prayers I need. I'm wa- literally walking in the presence of healing. I'm literally walking in the presence of peace. I'm literally walking in God's provisions. He sees and knows the prayers of my heart anyways. And so as a God who loves me, he's working on my behalf because he loves me. He can't help himself. Understand that. You know what a shepherd does? The shepherd never waits for the sheep to call out to help. Doesn't have to. That's because it's the shepherd's job to see the need, to see the wolves, and to protect. The shepherd doesn't wait for the sheep to come to say, hey, will you feed me? No, it's his job. And so the Bible says that Jesus is the good shepherd. And so it's his job. Let him do his job. And understand that he's working in and through your life each and every day. Yeah, but it gets a little complicated. I know. But listen to this. Look in first, our 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Follow me on this. It says, therefore, do not lose heart. That's what I would be saying to you right now. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. See, we are so consumed by the outward struggles, the, 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 the circumstances, the, the battles, the hardship, relationships, everything, and we're so consumed by that which is going on around us, God's like, hey, who cares? I'm doing something internally that's going to help you with all this. Just walk with me. I love this verse. Let let me read it again. It says, therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being. Paul's saying, I'm being renewed every day. I'm battling a lot of stuff. I'm going through a lot of stuff, but I know every day God's giving me new strength. Every day God has given me a new peace. Every day God has given me new wisdom for the moment. Every day God is working because I'm walking and living in his presence. Every day. Now, today God wants to do a new thing in your life. And so here's what I want you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to know you're never going to have a fresh start without a fresh heart. you got to do that first. Now, here's what you need to do. Embrace God's grace. Embrace God's grace. 
And, and so like, well, that sounds cool. It's kind of catchy. Embrace God's grace. Yeah, I can, yeah. What, what does that mean? Here's how you do that. It starts at number one. Write this down. Repent and pray. What is that? Giving God your heart. A fresh start requires a fresh heart. Look, that's what David did. David made some big mistakes. How many would agree King David really blew it? But he realized that when he went to God, it wasn't about, hey, God, give me a bigger kingdom. Because my enemies are really pressing in. Hey, God, give me some wisdom. Hey, God, give me strength because, man, this, the, the, the relational internal issues I'm dealing with the kingdom, I really need your help on this. Those are typical prayers that we might pray. Look what David prayed in 50, verse 51, the book of Psalm, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. David realized that before anything good externally was going to happen, something had to be fixed internally. I have a heart that's messed up. And so David's going to God and saying, hey, God, create in me a clean heart. Man, my heart's dirty. My heart's got spots on it. My, my, my heart's dark. Let's start there, God. And, and also, in, in regards to my, my spirit, renew it, strengthen it. See, David is dealing internally. He realized that the, the, the first step is to, to, to repent and to just pray and exalt God in his life. That's where we start. We tend to start, God, help that person that's all mad at me or fix this whole problem over here and all this stuff here. And the whole time, we don't want to deal with what's inside here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, remember we're not talking about walking in the presence of God? In Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. A fresh start always starts with God. Now, here's a powerful truth. Almost all through the, the New Testament, when, when Paul, he made that, that phrase he used so many times, in God or in Christ, in Christ, we're in Christ, in Christ. And when you look at that and, and you study that in the Greek and what he's saying, it's literally this image as a, as a body being laid in a tomb and covered. That he's just consumed by the presence of God. And, and isn't that how it should be to where we die to our old self and we're, we're consumed, we come alive in the very presence of God? But here's the deal. We forget that we come alive out in Christ and we're these new creatures in Christ. That we, very, we walk in the very presence of Christ. But when we talk and think about God, it's, it's as if that's not the case. It's like he's, no, he's up in heaven somewhere. He, uh, yeah, yeah, he loves me, but you know, someday I'll see him. And so, hey, God, can you help me with this? Instead of realizing, hey, God, man, look what the mess I got us into this time. Hey, God, I really got us into a mess this time, huh? Man, I, I, I know you're working already. I know that you're at work already. Forgive me. See, the Israelites, uh, another great picture of that, the Israelites realized, remember when they were going to go back to rebuild the temple? And so, they're, they're, what do you do when you're going to rebuild something? A lot of us were thinking, you know what? We need to get the foundation. We need to strengthen our foundation. Let's build it on a good foundation. Or, you know what? We're going to build the exterior walls first. We're going to kind of get this all dialed in. And then we're going to start working on the inter- interior walls and the roof and things like that. And uh, that, that wasn't their, their goal at all. Now, the leaders, the first things that the leaders did, which is uh, Jeshua and uh, Zerubba, Zerubbabel, they must have hated their kids. Um, the first thing that they wanted to do before they started the, the building, I mean, it's just rubble everywhere. Let's build the altar. Let's build the altar of God. This is the first thing. In Ezra chapter 3, verse 2, says this. His associates began to build the altar of God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it. All restoration, all renewal starts with God at the altar. Prayer and repentance. That's where it all starts. And so, it's an amazing picture because 
Here they are like, man, this, look, look at all the rubble. Well, look at the mess. And we're going to rebuild this? Well, before we get started, let's, we better start this right. Let's build the altar. And so they, in the midst of the chaos, they built the altar of God and began to make sacrifices and pray to God and ask for forgiveness and, and to ask for God's guidance. He was in the center of the chaos. I think that's such an incredible picture. So then the day comes, all the Israelites, the Israelites are all coming to help. It's, it's work day. We're going to start building. And can you imagine arriving that morning to start work on rebuilding the temple of God, how excited you were, and then you see, sticking up out of the rubble, the altar of God. Right away, you're like, God's here with us. See, whenever you go to the altar of prayer and repentance, you're reminding yourself every single day, in the midst of the rubble, God's with me. God is in the midst of this problem. God is going to guide me through this situation. God is going to help me. Never, ever, ever underestimate the power of the altar. Because it's there we humbly go before God and we bow while we exalt him. And we say, forgive us, Lord. It always starts with the altar of God. Now, how do we embrace grace? Through repentance and prayer. Number two, refocus on God's word. Fill your heart with Jesus. I always tell you this, that, that, that the Bible is Jesus on paper. That, that you, 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 that you're sitting there with Jesus. And, you're, and it's the word of God. He's speaking into your life. How many would agree with me that the Bible is the word of God, the inspired word of God? Are we, we all on the same page with that? That it's God's word? Some of you are not, not too sure? Listen, do you think that of these 66 books, over 40 authors and hundreds and hundreds of years to write and establish this book, that there could be error in it? Any mistakes? Because that's what the devil would like to tell you. Oh, really? God, God didn't say that. Because if you think there's just a sliver of error in the word of God, then how do you know when you're reading that sliver? If you think 5% is not correct, then how do you know when you're reading the 5%? You have to believe it's the living and enduring word of God. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is God-breathed. So we need to quit blowing off what's God-breathed. And we need to realize, because look, you say, oh, no, it's, I believe it's the word of God. Do you believe then it's sacred, that, that, that is the, it's the divine word of God? I mean, you believe it's sacred. You believe it's so divine. It's so incredible. It's so precious that it sits on a shelf getting dust. Right? Pick it. Bible's so awesome. Church, look, so often, here's one of the things, and surveys show this over and over again, the church doesn't read the Bible. I know there's faithful few, and, and you, you, you're reading it every single day. I get it. But you know what? The vast majority of the church isn't really taking hold of the word of God and spending time with Jesus because it changes you. Let me just tell you a little secret. Whenever you read the word of God, it changes you. Don't try to go by feelings and all that kind of stuff. Just read it. It does something. It's a, it's a cleansing agent. It begins to change your heart. It just does. I don't know how it works. It's, it's God's word. It's way above my pay grade. But I do know this. As Peter said, it's the living and enduring. It's alive. Just read it. Just start reading it. And, 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 and just allow and trust that God's going to work. Trust that it's being seeded in your heart. Trust that God is just beginning to do something special. So... My thought would be, how, how did the Israelites know to start with the altar of God before they started building the, 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 the temple of God? Ezra 3, 2 says this. I'm going to read the whole verse here. It says, his associates began to build the altar of God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And Ezra 3, 4 says this. Then, in accordance with what is written... They celebrated the Festival of Tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings described for each day. Now, here's how much you to think about this. They're following the instruction from the Word of God. That's how they knew. They adhered to the Word of God. 
Everything that we do, the word of God is, is the deciding factor. Everything that we do, every, how we process everything, it has to go through the word of God. Does it line up with the word of God? If it doesn't, throw it out. It was a priority with the Israelites. Now, that's the standard that we use to evaluate everything, is the word of God. What's God say about this? Jesus did that in the wilderness. Well, it's written. It is written. Every time he had a counter with the devil, he said it, was written. it is written. Jesus said, everything I'm going to do is going to be according to the word of God. Get it? Okay, now, let's review. Now, if we're going to embrace God's grace, we're going to embrace God's grace, number one, repent and pray. Build the altar, establish an altar in your life. Never underestimate the power of an altar. Number two, refocus on God's word. Fill your heart with Jesus. So one is giving God your heart at the altar. Number two is filling your heart with Jesus through his word. And number three, now that you've done those things, you're in a position to do number three, which is rely on God. Trust God with all your heart. Now you can, just, you can be real. You, you, you can get rid of the smile of denial. You, can, you stop pretending like everything's wonderful. And you can just say, yeah, things are going, but I'm trusting God. I want you to see this in Isaiah 43. It says, see, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Don't rely on what you see. Rely on what God sees. God sees a way out. A wilderness uh, is, is a place that has no paths. You, you know, you have to say, yeah, I'm in a wilderness, man. I'm just in a weird place, man. I don't know where to go, what to do. I'm just in a mess. Trust God. You know, I, I've seen a blind man trust his seeing eye dog better than we trust God. Think about that. Here's a man or a woman that is literally trusting their dog. And, and, and there's... Trusting on what the dog sees. So they have the seeing eye dog that's going to do all the seeing. And, and, and that dog goes forward, they go with it. The dog backs up, maybe cautious about something or something startles it. Uh, the, the, the person stops. The, if the dog goes left, the person goes left. They literally follow the guidance of that dog. Blind, totally trusting the dog. And in that scripture, he's saying, don't you see what I'm doing? You don't, you don't see it? I'm making paths in wilderness. And, 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 and so God is saying, trust me. And that's why it's so important that you embrace grace, the presence of God in your life. That's why it's vitally important that you have an altar and there's regular repentance and prayer. And then that you're spending time in the word of God. And now you're in a position to where the trusting comes a lot easier. But when we skip one and two and try to trust and, and live out step number three, we doubt. We, we give up. We quit. And so we need to realize that the other two, that comes first. And then it gets a lot easier to trust God and trust his eyes when you don't see anything working out. It's, it's hard. How many would agree it's hard sometimes to trust? To really trust God. Why do we conceal our heart instead of letting God heal our heart? Here's why. We have a knowing problem. Because there's two types of knowing. There's uh, informational knowing, and then there's relational knowing. Now, they're totally different. Now, you can know someone informationally, or you can know someone personally. Two are totally different. Because you can have your favorite athlete or celebrity, and you can Google, you can find out everything about them. And, and they'll have all this information come to you when they're born, what their favorite color is, what they're into, what their hobbies are, how old they are, and all this stuff. You can have all this information allowing you to know a whole bunch about them. But if I went to you and said, yeah, but do you know them personally? Like, no. Oh, so you just know a lot about them. And I think sometimes we fall into that trap with God. We know all about God. And see, there's the difference between information and relation is the, it, it, one is just trivial stuff. So one, one's just information. The other one is the heart. 
You don't know the heart of these individuals that you admire, but you know all about them. And I think sometimes we fall into that trap with God because depending on what you know, if you, if you lean more towards the relational knowing in regards to God or the uh, personal knowing that you know him personally, uh, it, it's going to be totally different how you approach him. Because what happens is, see, we know a lot about God. We, we, can, we can track the hand of God all through Scripture. All of his exploits, all of his deeds, his accomplishments. He, he parted the Red Sea. He rolled the Jordan back. He walked on water. He healed the, the blind man. He cleansed the leper. All this information about God. And what you tend to do is put your trust in, in his ability. Yeah, God can meet the need of my life. That's good. Yeah, God can do anything. That's good. But here's the problem with that. If you don't have the heart part, when it doesn't go according to your will, your plan, your timing, all of a sudden you start doubting it all. And it's a huge, huge difference because it goes like this. I know he walked on the water, did all that. But then all of a sudden, if I look in the scripture, I say, you know what? I, he so loved the world that he gave his son. And, and, and I saw how he dealt with the adulterous woman. And I, and I saw how he dealt with the woman at the well. And, and I can read about how he, how he loved his disciples. And then how he laid his life down for me. And I, can, and, and I gave my life to him. And how he loved me. And, 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 and I can really sense the heart of God. See, Charles Spurgeon said something once. When you can't track the hand of God, trust his heart. And that's the deeper place that I'm talking about, that we need to get to. Because everything around me could be falling apart. I can believe God's power can do this and fix this and change this and alter that. I get all that. But if I don't see any of that, I can still be okay because I'm going to trust his heart. I know he loves me. And I know he's with me. And, and, and though it's not going the way I think it should be going, and I'm not seeing the results I want to see, and it's not happening in my timing, I know God loves me. And so where I can't track his hand, I'll trust his heart. Yes. And that's where we need to get to. And so that uh, changes everything. And, and if you're not building your altar, if you're not spending time in repentance and prayer, if you're not spending time in, in his word, because those two mesh together, and I see the beating heart of God. And once I know that... I can embrace that and say, you know what? I can trust God in all things because it doesn't matter if it goes my way. It doesn't matter if it goes the way I think it should. I know God. It's not just informational knowing. It's relational knowing. And I know his heart. I know he's going to take care of me. It may not be the way I think it's going to go. And I may have to learn some things. Maybe he wants to stretch me, mold me, shape me. I don't know why it's going the way it's going, but I know his heart is going to do the best thing for me. And so I'm just going to hold on. I can hold on a lot longer with that. But if it's just informational, I'm like, yeah, you know, he can do all these great things, but he just really never does anything for me. Or, or I, I must have missed it or whatever. We got to push through that. And those first two steps, if you're not doing that, this third one here, trusting God, no matter what, is going to be very difficult because you've got to know his heart. And if you know the heart of God, I assure you, you can trust it. You will know you can trust it, regardless of what things are, are what, what is happening in my life. Get it? All right. Now, so it doesn't matter what the rubble is, the chaos in your life. That heart of yours that might be wounded, maybe you've been uh, walking around with a smile, denial forever, and you just pretend that your world is wonderful. God wants to change that. God wants to heal your heart. I believe that's the goal today. Give him your heart and prayer and repentance. Fill your heart with his word and then trust him with all your heart. That's the goal. If the worship team will come up. Amen. Praise the Lord. So as they're coming up, let me just recap this. The first step, repentance, requires a surrendered heart. Second step, refocus on God's word, requires an obedient heart. The third step, rely on God, requires a trusting heart. Let's embrace God's grace. Let's pray.
But Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your presence that is in our lives each and every day. Even when we sense it, feel it, it doesn't matter. You're there. Help us, Lord, to go beyond this informational knowing of you to this relational knowing. Let us truly know your heart. Help us, Lord, to spend time with you at the altar and repent and to confess to you and to pray to you and to just spend time with you in the midst of the rubble. And may we look to your word and just read it and let it fill our hearts. And then, Lord, may we be uh, becoming more and more of that child of God you've called us to be, that we could trust you with all our heart, regardless of what the circumstances are telling us. Help each and every one of us to know your heart like you know ours. And may your will be done each and every day in our lives. Take us to a new place with you, a new walk. Thank you for that, Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just want to take a quick moment. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not right with God. Then it's not a coincidence that you're here this morning. Maybe you served the Lord years ago, or, but since then life's happened and you've drifted and you're not right with God. Don't leave this place with a heart that's not right with God. That's where it all starts. And so if that's you this morning, I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to have you come forward or anything like that. But you're saying, you know what? I need Christ as my Lord and Savior this morning. Just raise your hand. Is there anybody? Real quick, I see your hand in the front. I see your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I see you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? I need Christ as my Lord and Savior today. I want to leave this place right with God. I see your hand. Thank you. Church, I want to lead you in a prayer. And here at Heart of the Valley, nobody goes it alone. We all will say this prayer together. You will repeat after me. Maybe you know you need to make things right with God, but you are uncomfortable to raise your hand because, well, you just didn't know what was going to happen. Say this prayer as well with a sincere heart and let God change your life. Church, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die for me. Dear Lord Jesus, Thank you for laying down your life so that I would have life, life everlasting. Forgive me of my sins and be Lord of my life. Dear Lord Jesus, you know my heart. Help me that I might know your heart and grow in the things of God. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.